All right. Well, I'm here with Dan Doherty of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Dan is a research biologist with TPWD, and he is going to talk to us today about what he does. So why don't you tell us what you do, Dan? Nice to be here. Um, I'm a, like, like you say, I'm a, a fisheries research biologist for the Inland Fisheries Division of, of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And uh, mainly our uh, primary role um, within the division is to design and conduct um, fisheries research um, that is that that um, allows us to provide the information to uh, better manage fisheries in Texas. Okay, great. That's interesting. And fisheries in Texas, for folks who don't know, I mean, what all does that entail? What are we talking about with fisheries in Texas? Well, it could really be it could really be anything from you know the uh, probably the most well known fisheries in Texas like largemouth bass fisheries, um, it, but it could be things that uh, people don't necessarily also fish for like various uh, cyprinid minnows, um, you know native native non non game species of fish, um, uh, in any kind of system essentially rivers reservoirs small streams, you know. Um, pretty much anywhere across the state. Okay, so you're not just working like with game fish, you're working on maybe like the whole ecosystem or all the fish in the ecosystem, is that right? Yeah, yeah, some some of our work is is species specific obviously for uh for an, usually um when it's either a uh, a conservation related issue given, you know, some rare threatened state endangered um, you know, species of greatest conservation need type species. Um, but we also uh, do um, work on the community level. So, you know, figuring out community dynamics and fish assemblages and how they respond to various uh, biotic and abiotic factors as well. Okay, sounds good. Well, one of the things I think that you work on is alligator gar. I think you've done a bit of work with them. And that's what we want to talk to you about today. Can we just start with what is an alligator gar? Yeah, so um, we've been working on alligator gar for about uh, a little over a decade now in Texas, particularly our office here at uh, Heart of the Hills Fishery Science Center. Um, an alligator gar is the largest of the gar species. So you have, uh, in Texas, you can find short nose gar, you can find long nose gar, spotted gar, and alligator gar. And alligator gar are by far the largest. They're our largest freshwater fish in the state. They're also our oldest freshwater fish in the state as well. Um, we have documented age of alligator gar in Texas to 64 years. Wow. That's cool. I didn't, I guess I, I might've guessed that they were the biggest, but I don't know that I'd ever heard that. Definitely didn't yeah. know that they were the oldest. Yeah. They're the, they're the largest of the, of all gar species. We can, like I said, you can find four uh, different species in Texas. There are seven um, species uh, across North America, Central uh, America. Um, but four of them you can find right here in Texas. Okay. Neat. And when you say they're the oldest, you're talking about they live the longest, but I think. Well, yes and no. Uh, well, yes and yes. Um, I'm <laughs> talking about they live the longest, but I'm also, um, I'm, you can also think about it as in terms of them being a, an ancient fish, a primitive fish. Um, they've been around in the fossil record uh, up to a, a, uh, probably about 200 million years. Um, and so the, the, the fossils uh, that you, that have been found that, um, for alligator gar uh, in the Permian Basin, they look exactly, the fossil looks exactly like uh, modern day gar. So they've, uh, they've retained uh, the vast majority of their primitive characteristics um, to today. That's pretty neat. That's, that's really neat. I mean, that raises all sorts of questions like, why wouldn't something change? Did it just not need to change or what? I mean, any yeah, I think, idea? you know, I think they're a pretty resilient species. And so, you know, they haven't, they haven't really had to adapt to much, much change um, or, or haven't, you know, you know, the selective pressures just haven't been there for them to change much. Okay. That's really interesting. So where can we find them? You said they're freshwater fish. Can you right. be more specific or tell us like wh where we might find them? 
Yeah, sure. You know, they're classified as a freshwater fish, um, but they're very urihaline or able to tolerate a wide range of salinities. You know, in freshwater, you have very low, low salinities. Um, obviously, as you transition to the coast, you start getting into the brackish water where the salinities are higher, out into the bay systems higher yet, and then out into full strength seawater, which is roughly 35 parts per thousand, I believe. Um, is classified as, as full seawater, but you can actually find alligator gar in freshwater and all the way out to full strength seawater. Wow. Um, highest recorded um, salinity at a site that an alligator gar has been found has been 52 parts parts per thousand, which which is like you know very salty. Um, they're they're more rare the higher the salinity, but um, but like in our bay systems, there are tons of alligator gar. Okay. And do they, um, like, oh, go ahead. I was just, just going to add, uh, if you want to like visualize where they are in the state, if you kind of draw a line from like Lake Texoma through Dallas to Austin over to Del Rio, okay. everything to the east of that essentially is kind of the alligator gar range in the state. Okay. That's interesting. And do they like slow waters like lake water or do you find them in fast moving water or what? Yeah, they're, you know, given that they grow so big, I mean, the biggest ones that we've actually handled here in Texas are over eight feet. Um, they, they're not a fast water species. They typically like um, slow moving, um, like pool habitats and rivers. Um, and then also like uh, you find them in a lot of reservoirs and um like, like uh, again, out into the bay systems where you, you don't have any, you know, just any flow really to speak of. So you, you don't typically find them um, in the fast moving riffle and run habitats of rivers or things like that. Okay. And what do they eat? Well, they're what is classified as an opportunistic feeder. So they're not specifically targeting any particular uh, uh, prey item per se. Um, they pretty much um, feed based on what's what's available. So a lot of the times, you know, the, the that's more um, the quote unquote rough fishes, um, for lack of a better term. Um, also like, you know, gizzard shad, uh, buffalo, carps, so on and so forth. They're typically more, they constitute more of the biomass in systems than, you know, like game fishes do. So you, they tend to feed mainly on, on things like, like shad, carp, buffalo, so on and so forth. In the base systems, they feed also primarily on shad, mullet, and some, and crab as well. All right. But there's, so they're strictly predators. They're not eating any like sea grasses or Mm -hmm. life or anything no. like that no okay very cool so if i heard you correctly they they eat almost only largemouth bass right <laughs> <laughs> no you you did not hear me correctly <laughs> <laughs> okay i just wanted to make sure yeah that you know that's that was one of the great misconceptions about alligator gar before anybody started working on them was that they tended to eat sport fish primarily um namely largemouth bass, uh, crappie, white bass, things like that. And so they had this bad reputation um, of, of, you know, being a competitor, essentially, of, of the fishermen. So um, while they will eat a largemouth bass here and there or a crappie here and there, again, it's opportunistic. So, you know, if they happen to be in the one spot and a bass happens to, to swim by and, and they can grab it, they'll grab it. But they're not actually out targeting them um which was like the common misconception back in the day and that's and that's why you know prior to probably the 1990s 2000s uh alligator gar they were not managed there was there was no no limits that you could take as many as you wanted there were actually efforts by our predecessor agency which was the texas uh game and oyster oyster commission i can't remember exactly what the name of it was but uh there were, there were um, efforts to actually go out and eradicate gars, not just alligator gars, but gars in general from mm -hmm. systems because of that thought that they were, they were highly, uh, a, high, a, a large competitor um, for game fish. 
I did not know that. Say that was actually ex our exact next question. I was going to ask you about their <laughs> conservation history here in Texas, but you answered that beautifully. Yeah, they, so there really was no conservation history until <laughs> you know the 2000s. We started working on them here um, in about 2007, um, and that was fueled by a kind of a kind of a paradigm shift. Um, prior to, you know, in, in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, I'll say, in that, in that range, uh, you know, a lot of folks were focused on, on the, uh, the classic game fishes, largemouth bass, white bass, crappie, so on and so forth. Um, as fisheries developed and people started to pursue other things, um, they, you know, the whole multi, the idea of a multi-species angler, where you've kind of got this bucket list of things you want to catch, kind of kind of changed from a from a from a classic traditional fisheries type to people started to pursue all these other species and all these other places and it, and, and um, we started to see an uptick in people coming to Texas to fish for alligator gar not just our you know Texas anglers but people coming from all over the world here to fish because we had great populations still despite our best efforts at at uh, at not not uh, you know, managing our, our fisheries for a long time for alligator car. So we we saw the this this uh, increase in um, interest and um, angling activity around alligator car, and so we wanted to make sure that we um, responded to that and collected the data we needed to make sure that we could manage uh, alligator gar fisheries here in Texas responsibly and sustainably. And that's that's where our, our work started. The first uh, the first regulation on alligator gar started in 2009 um, when we went from unlimited fishery to one fish per day per angler. And then in 2019, I believe there was a special regulation added on um, for the Trinity River, um, which is now a, a, a draw fishery for uh, a set number of tags per year for fish over 48 inches. Um, that's to, uh, was put in place essentially to protect the trophy quality of the fishery. Um, there's also a mandatory harvest reporting uh, for fish across the state with a couple exceptions. Um, where if you catch and keep an alligator gar, you're supposed to report it. Hmm. So that's interesting. How, how popular are they now? Could you like rank them among the other game fishes or something like that? Do you have any idea? Um, you know, relative to largemouth bass, they're still not, not, you know, that bass will probably always rank as our, our number one fishery. But I, I would say that they're probably in the top five uh, most sought after species, especially in freshwater, um, you know, the bass, crappie, catfish, um, striped bass, probably white bass. Um, they kind of clump together and then, and then probably alligator gar somewhere, somewhere around, around the number five mark. Okay. I it would say on the, on the coast, people fish for them on the coast as well. Uh, but, um, I, I don't know where they would rank out there that we have a, our, our, de our department has a coastal fisheries division. So mm -hmm. while I do some work on alligator gar there, we have that they're their own separate entity. So. Okay. Well, where would fishermen find the best trophies if they're looking for a trophy alligator gar? Well, like I said, the, the Trinity river is, Trinity. <clears throat> the Trinity river is world renowned for, um, the trophy potential of alligator gar. Um, there's a number, uh, a, a a lot of guide services um, taking clients from all over the world. And I know people that come from Europe and, and Asia and, 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 you know, just pretty much from everywhere to come and fish the Trinity river uh, to catch a, to catch a uh, alligator gar, particularly a trophy size alligator gar. And when I say trophy size or quality size, we're talking a fish six foot and up. There's plenty of fish in that system uh, over seven feet and and, uh, and a decent uh, chance at catching an eight foot plus fish. I, I just wow. want to throw something in there at the end. The uh, the guy who currently holds the world record for the largest gar has actually gone on record saying that he saw one out on the Trinity. He says, and I can't verify this, he said 14 feet. What? He said 14 feet. That's right. Yeah, that, that's a little far-fetched for me. <laughs> I, I, you know, I could see a nine, 
um, maybe a 10. There's a picture floating around out there from way back of this. It's a very old picture. I, I don't even know what the date on it would be. It's black and white. Um, it's this giant gar that's on this tape, this wooden table. Um, it's I've seen it a thousand times. I, I don't know where the where it came from. I don't know the authenticity of it. It suggests that there's a, you know, it's probably 10, 12 feet, probably 12 feet, something like that, just based on the, there's, there's a gentleman in the picture. But I don't know if, you know, there's a lot of debate whether that's authentic or not, and whether it's been photoshopped of sorts. Um, but yeah, 14 feet for me would definitely be a stretch, uh, but I, I could see, you know, a, a, a nine footer, possibly, maybe a 10. Mm -hmm. um, I've handled probably over 2000 fish and I've never, I've never had my hands on anything, you know, nine over nine, but I mean, there's no reason to say that, that, uh, that they couldn't get that, that length. Now, what makes a trophy? Is it just size alone or is there anything else? Like, you know, with... well, I, I, think, I think trophies in the eye of the beholder, oh, okay. you know, um, really. Um, but, but, you know, we, as fisheries researchers and biologists, we kind of set these, there's this, there's this whole kind of classification system you use where you have these different classes of fish and they're, they're set based on, on lengths. Um, and so usually, usually you set, you know, like a trophy class or a quality size fish, um, um, up there in the upper echelons of, of the length distribution that they can achieve. And so, you know, that's, for, for alligator gar, we usually use the six foot mark um, as being the uh, being the, the the quality size or 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 trophy size class mm -hmm. above the six. Okay, for folks who've never seen one in person, well, mm -hmm. I think I've only seen them at aquariums. But uh, uh, what color are they? What uh, do they come in like a range of different appearances or anything? Um. Yes. They. They. Well. Yes and no. Um, you can you can the, the the typical alligator gar looks very much like an alligator from the head, right? It's got this okay. duck build, you know, large large flat snout full of teeth. Um, they're usually an olive color um, with some with some black modeling uh, spotting in them, particularly you know near the fins on the fins, um, but there are color variants you can get them uh i've seen fish that are very light almost a yellowish appearance um and then also fish that have been jet black as well so so this is you know this is just this uh different just individual variation in their in their their uh their expression of various um colors um you know you get melanistic is kind of the black and the leucistic is kind of the yellow and and then the, the normal individual is that all of the green color in between. So mm -hmm. um, the, 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 obviously those, those ends of the spectrum, the black and the, and the yellowish color are, are pretty rare. I've seen about, I would say somewhere in the neighborhood of 1% or less um, of fish that are non-normally colored, um, but they do exist. And you actually can see um, quite a few uh, spotted gar which are the another species of the four I mentioned that are in Texas. There, there's there's quite a few of those that you can see come up to the surface and will be almost jet black, if not jet black. Hmm. Um, but it but it's less common in alligator gar. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So a lot of wildlife enthusiasts would they would love to have a career with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. You know what, what advice would you give to people who are trying to get that first entry level job with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department? You know, do you have anything specific that you could give them to help them get over the edge a little bit? Yeah. Um, well, you know, the the standard answer is is volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. Um, and and there's a there there's there's a good reason that that's why that's a standard answer. Um, and, and that's because people can associate a face with a name when, you know, like you said, you know, there's a lot of people that would like to get a job working with, with the state or federal government in a wildlife related field. Um, so when a, a job does come open, they're, they're highly com 
competitive. And so, you know, you've got a, a, someone sitting at a table that's got a stack of applications a mile long or a, a foot deep. Um, you know, they see names, but if you can put a name with a face, it, it makes a difference. And that's why they say, you know, people say, you know, volunteer wherever and whenever you can. Um, but on top of that, uh, one thing that I've noticed, this is my, I'm going on my 17th year uh, in, in this job. Um, one thing that I've noticed over time is people have gotten uh, away from a, a, a very complete and comprehensive application packet. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we've moved to a very electronic system of communication uh, in today's world. You know, when I very first started, um, this is going to date me, but um, my, my application was printed and sent. Um, it wasn't sent, you know, in, a, in an automated system online. Um, but, you know, when you, when you apply for a job online, which is like the requirement now, um, people tend to forget about things like cover letters, um, you know, you know uh, transcripts unless they're asked for, you know, so on and so forth. And one of the things I've seen the least of more recently, and this, this is the trend that I'm, I'm noticing uh, continue to get worse is people not uh, writing a good cover letter. Um, and again, you know, when you've got a stack of applications and uh, you've got to go through and, and, you know, whittle down that, that stack, it's nice to have a cover letter that's addressed to the job and, and you, it gives them, a, it gives us a summary essentially of everything in all the other pages. Mm -hmm. And that will get us to a point where we will want to look at the rest. Um, so I would strongly encourage um, people to, uh, to to do a good cover letter that's that's addressed to the job that you're applying for, not just a blanket cover letter for, you know, uh, what a, a bunch of jobs you're applying for, but actually that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's I, I'm sorry to mean to cut you off, but no, that's okay. No, that's I was pretty much wrapped up. Okay. No, that's uh, really interesting to hear because for years I taught here an introduction to uh, wildlife professions and we always had people do a resume and make a list of references and write a cover letter and they had to download a, a job that was being advertised right now, you know, currently right? Yeah. Um, from three or four different websites and, you know, Texas Parks and Wildlife might be one of them and write a letter for that job and that is the hardest thing for people to do so it really yeah. takes some practice it, yeah I, it does it, it, it's definitely a, a a skill that you need to work at in order yeah. to, to learn how to it's essentially a a, a sales pitch uh -huh. the way i kind of look at it i've always kind of thought about it is the cover letter is a sales pitch about why you should hire you yeah you know? well you know i always told them that the uh resume is sort of the, you know, why you should interview me. And I, I really like how you said that the cover letter is, you know, why we should go on with the rest of the packet. Why should we look at your resume and your application? Uh, right. You know, we, we need to see that in the, in the cover letter. So that's interesting, but um, such an important part. And yeah, I think you're right. People, um, maybe they, they aren't very, comfortable with it so they just want to skip it now so yeah good to know that's really good advice i think don't you think andrew i think that's wonderful advice yeah yeah well so uh want to ask you what your favorite fun fact is about alligator guard do you have a favorite little like little known fun fact yeah yeah well where do i start there's a whole <laughs> bunch of very interesting things about alligator guard yeah. i mean I've after having worked with them for over a decade now, pick up a lot of little things. Yeah. Um, I've got, I've got two in particular. Okay. If, if you'll indulge me for two. Yes. Um, sure. The first one is that alligator gar and gars in general, but particularly alligator gar uh, can drown. What? Yeah. So, I uh, that. yes. So, so, uh, they're they're classified as what's called a, a facultative air breather so they're and so they're mouth breathers then <laughs> sort of yeah yeah so, <laughs> so they uh you know they, they're you know going back to what we were talking about earlier about 
<clears throat> you know, them not having the selective pressures to have to have changed much over the the eons of years or whatever you want to call it that they've yeah. been around. Um, one of their adaptations is pretty much to be able to live in any kind of water quality of sorts, even low, low dissolved oxygen, very hot water, warm water, hot water, however you want to say it. Mm -hmm. um, and how they've been able to, to do that is, is while they have gills like a normal fish where they exchange oxygen, dissolved oxygen out of the water, their swim bladder, which is for a fish is the, the a bladder on the inside that, um, that regulates their buoyancy essentially. Mm -hmm. Most people know it's it's a it's an organ just like a like a balloon of sorts inside. And the more air they pump into that, obviously the more buoyant they are and they can rise to the surface or you know they can they can uh, control their position in the water column. If you open up an alligator gar and you look at the swim bladder, it looks like a lung. It's highly vascularized. It's pink. I mean, it really looks like a lung it's interesting. as opposed to like a, like a clear balloon swim bladder that you would see in a more modern fish. And so they take in a lot of oxygen through the swim bladder. And when you see them, if you've ever been by a river or a lake or whatever that has out, uh, gar in it, even, all the species do it, but um, they'll come up to the surface and they'll just take a gulp. And that air then goes into the swim bladder and they're actually able to take the air out of, or take the oxygen out of that air and supplement their, um, their oxygen intake in the bloodstream. Very cool. I did not know. When the water temperatures get really hot in the summer, <clears throat> 80, 90 degrees, say, um, they can actually drown. If they can't get up to the surface to gulp air, uh, they are unable to, to maintain their oxygen levels and they can actually drown. Hmm. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a pretty crazy thing to think about a fish that can drown. Yeah. But, now would that happen in the wild or would they have to be like confined below for that to happen? Um, it, it can happen. Uh, so we've had it happen when we're sampling in the summer, like we use these nets, um, to mm -hmm. catch them and mm -hmm. tag and release or whatever if they get caught in the net and we don't get them out of there fast enough they can drown sure um but the other way that it happens in more of a natural setting um is take for instance like people fishermen set out a jug line um for catfish mm -hmm. and an alligator gar comes along and grabs the bait and it's swimming around with that jug line. Well, if it happens to swim by a like standing timber or something and gets that wrapped around the jug line wrapped around the, uh, the timber, it can't get to the surface to get air. It can, it can drown on a jug line. Matter of fact, a lot of, a lot of folks I've talked to fishermen and stuff say that, that, uh, they've, they've had quite a few alligator gar on jug lines that are drowned. Wow. Interesting. Okay. The other, the other, uh, the second thing I wanted to bring up was that, um, you know, while we were talking about the trophy slash quality size fish over six feet, yeah, about ninety nine percent of those are all female fish. Really? Um, yes. Uh, male alligator gar do not typically get above six feet in length, and they're usually more like about five feet in length. Um, all the big fish are the females, so. That's important from the perspective of uh, a fishery that's very highly targeted toward the large fish um, is putting in, you know, an unequal amount of pressure on those females. And what's even more important is if you think about population persistence, uh, it's, it's always the females that matter, right? They're the ones that carry sure. the eggs. Um, you know, one male can fertilize the eggs of multiple females, but sure. you know, we need all the females to have all the eggs. So it's uh, something I always bring up with folks that are, you know, interested in learning about alligator gar biology that uh, those, those big fish are, are really the, the females and the future of the, of the population. So mm -hmm. handle with care. Yeah. So I guess you have to be really, um, I guess you have to stay on top then of how many trophies are being taken and, and that mm -hmm. sort of thing so that you don't yeah. complete the population. Right. Yeah. The, the good thing that we find with, with uh, the 
trophy oriented fishery for alligator gar is it's it's largely uh catch and release oh. so um a lot of guys uh that fish obviously hook and line now bow fishing is a different story you can bow fish for alligator gar um but once you've once you've shot an alligator gar it's illegal to uh release it um mm-hmm. uh, that's your harvest for the day uh so uh but on the on the hook and line side um <clears throat> we've had uh fish that were tagged that have been recaptured three four or five times wow. so uh so they're they're surviving uh capture and are being you know able to be recaught again over and over yeah that's really interesting what are what are your future do you have future conservation goals laid out for alligator gar um future goals i think our future goals are probably the goals that we've had uh since day one and that's just to uh continue to manage the fisheries for alligator gar in texas in a scientific manner so the more information you know that we get um the the more that we apply that to how we manage um i think you know we've spent the better part of a decade now getting the 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 basic information that we have needed age growth recruitment mortality all those types of dynamic rate estimates so on and so forth um that have allowed us now to to really kind of set the course for sustainable uh, management of, of the populations. And um, I think going forward, we, we may see some regulations change, uh, but not, not in a way that is any different, um, that is counter to what our, our ultimate goal has always been. And that's just to maintain these, these quality fisheries in perpetuity. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. Did you have something you were going to ask, Andrew? Um, I was just going to throw in, you, you've talked about the, the females being the larger of the two and also that they, uh, just the size being a factor. Do they, do they not reach sexual maturity until a later point in their life? Kind of like sturgeon do. Um, you mean the males and the females versus females? I just like, is there a reason that we see the, the females being so big? Do they not get to sexual maturity until later on? Or do you still, do you see them reproducing in the younger ages? They start to reach, uh, well, males somewhere between two and three years old, they'll reach sexual maturity. Females a little bit later. Um, I wouldn't say we have a really great estimate on that yet, uh, but probably in the three to five age range, they start to reach maturity. Um, But we don't, you know, that's a lot that's based on primarily the the growth trajectories and modeling and suggesting based on what we see there where the where the uh where the uh where sexual maturity might start to take place but we also don't know how long that process is you know just you know the onset of sexual maturity is different from actually being reproductively mature right so it could be a multi-year process um, by the time they actually produce eggs so uh, we start to see the, 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 the growth taper off or, or a different growth stanza at those, you know, three to five year range, but we don't know when those eggs are first produced at what age for the average fish yet. Um, <clears throat> the other reason that, you know, uh, thinking, you know, from a theoretical perspective, uh, basic biology perspective, you know, the, the larger the fish, the more eggs uh, she can hold. Um, obviously, you know, for a male, it's not as important. The, you know, the milt is, is microscopic, um, whereas, you know, the eggs, uh, much bigger. So, uh, the larger the female, the the more, the more eggs she, she's able to carry. So that makes sense that the female, um, reaches larger body sizes as well. Yeah. So, how, about how many will a uh, you know an average nest uh, be? Um, gosh, I, I I'm gonna take a shot in the dark here. Okay. Um, that's not some that's not an area where I've done a lot of work. Uh, but I want to say you know a small mature female, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of fifty thousand eggs. But, wow. You know large mature female could be upwards of probably 250,000 of half a million eggs. Um, 
and 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 the uh, they spawn um, relatively infrequently. So they're what's called a periodic strategist. So they they don't spawn every year. Um, their spawning is tied to floods during spring and early summer, um, where they will you know if the floodwaters leave the bank and they get these open you know uh, like uh, floodplain areas that have vegetation on them you'll find them swimming around one big female usually flanked by five or six small males and she leads them around they, they're jockeying for position all the time and uh, presumably she releases some pheromone that says now's now's the now's the, it's go time you know and uh, and she starts to release those eggs on this on these uh, this vegetation and the males all jockey and, and fertilize the eggs. And the eggs actually uh, are adhesive. So they stick to the vegetation. And, um, and they hatch really quickly, like 24 to 48 hours, those, those eggs are hatched. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. But, well, you know, that's tied to the fact that you've got a, a temporary condition of yeah. you know, the flood water. So Floodline. they can't, you know, they, they've got to be hatched before that flood starts to recede or they'll sure. be desiccated. So sure. very interesting biology. Yeah. Interesting. And does she stick around for that day or two or whatever nope. and guard them nope. or she just takes off? Nope. They're not, they're not in a nest. They're more or less broadcast across, gotcha. uh, across mm -hmm. the vegetation and then everybody goes about their merry way. Yeah. And, uh, the individual, and the little babies um, are off, all fend for themselves and they're super cannibalistic. So, so they'll, we've, we've been out sampling young a year and you know, like you, they, you can net them up when they're like an inch or less, maybe an inch and a half or less. They're just kind of sitting right at the surface. They look like a little stick. Um, and uh, we'd be netting them up and putting them in a bucket, and and uh, and then stop and count what we have. And they're eating each other in the bucket. Wow. So it's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. that is really neat. Well, I've learned so much about alligator gar. This is a really interesting species. Yeah, yeah. Very. It is definitely. I've, I've, it's been a pleasure to work on them. It's I bet. I bet it's made for a really fun career and a very interesting yeah. job. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about today? Oh, I don't know. I mean, do you have any questions that you want to continue on? I, I <laughs> do you have anything? I would just, I guess, I, I guess I would throw in there that I would encourage people to go out and 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 fish for alligator gar. Try it. It's it's not something that I mean. If you have a heavy heavy rod, um, you know, and some 40, 40 pound power pro, all you need is is uh, you know, some cut bait and throw it out there and fish in the, you know, in, in some deep water, slack water areas on, on your local river where, you know, there's alligator gar. We have a, we have an actual dedicated page to alligator gar on our, on our TPWD webpage. Okay. Uh, people can find out uh, where to go fish for them. And uh, I think people will really enjoy, you know, the fight of, uh, of an alligator gar. Cause like I said, you know, how, how many places can you go and catch a six, seven, eight foot fish or have the potential yeah. to? Yeah, no, no, nothing in, in, at least in North American freshwater, fights or jumps like an alligator gar. The only thing that I would say holds a candle to it is probably a white sturgeon out in the Pacific Northwest. You know, they get, they get large, they get to be uh, 20 feet long. I mean, they're, they're, a, they're, a, yeah, they're a really, really big the, the the biggest of the sturgeon species i think and at least in the continental u.s anyway i think there's nine species of sturgeon in the u.s um or north america and they're the largest but but other but as far as texas fish goes yeah you're not gonna it's like tarpon of the of the fresh freshwater tarpon that sounds like fun so they're big i didn't and they're a challenge to catch it's a kind of a finesse fish to where yeah. you know you it, yeah Actually, yeah, it's not super high tech, but it's 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 uh you know you don't catch them on every cast. Hmm. Okay, and so people can go to your website and get a little 
um, some hints or some details about? Oh yeah, we have we have everything on there. Um, we have basic biology information. We have information about how we're managing. Uh, we have tips on how to go fish for them, um, and that can be found at www.tpwd.gov, and then go to the the fishing page and then scroll down you'll see fisheries management and under there you'll see alligator guard and that will take you to the to the page that has all that information on it okay great well i think that's a good place to stop i hope people will go and and uh, find a new fish to cat to fish for <laughs> right yeah absolutely um, well, thank you so much for being here. I really enjoyed talking sure. to you. Learned a lot about uh, Alligator Guard, too. I enjoyed it as well. Okay. Thank you. A Talk on the Wild Side is a production of the Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute of Texas A&M University, Kingsville. Funding for this project is provided by the Harvey Wild Sportsman Conservationist Award by the Rotary Club of Corpus Christi. Editing was completed by the talented Gabby Olivas, Andrew Lowry, and Trey Kendall. We thank the Tamak Distance Learning Lab for all their help and cooperation.